This is chapter 20, video four. Let's launch. Okay, so in this class, we're going to do the cal calculate and characterize partners' ordinary income or loss into separately stated items, determine how these items are reported to partners. All right, before we begin this, let's think about this from a theoretical standpoint. If I have a corporation and I do some income and, then I, and I have income from different sources, I have income from operations, I have income from interest, I have income from dividends, I have income from... Um, from, uh, you know, from capital gains, from other stuff and things of that nature. They're going to get reported on different portions of the tax return. But what's going to happen is, and they're going to get segregated out, but generally it's going to go into ordinary income because it's all going to be taxed. Okay, if you have dividends, you're going to get taxed at, you know, the dividends rate. Of course, you got the DRD, so there's going to be a reduction on that. But, there's, but whatever's left over is going to be taxed at ordinary rates. You then have the... Um, the interest, which is going to be tax ordinary rates. So you don't really have a whole lot of craziness that kind of goes into this. Again, when we talk about part, when we talk about individual tax returns, it's a lot of loosey goosey stuff. I'll let you deduct this when this happens. I'll let you deduct this when this happens. Yeah. You know, charitable contributions go over here, da, 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 so on and so forth. So on a corporation, a lot of this stuff, you know, for, especially from a financial perspective, we're just going to put this into operations. And it's, you know, if I make a donation, it's going to go into operations. Now, in the tax return, we're going to bifurcate some of that stuff out and we're going to we're going to move things around as we need to. But generally speaking, a lot of that stuff is going to show up in one number. All right. There's going to be a few things that have to be broken out and calculated differently. You got to show calculations and all that sort of stuff. And, and, and we're not going to get too much into that right now. From a partnership standpoint, that's not necessarily the case. So you have ordinary operations, and then you also have charitable contributions, which if, you know, if it, and again, remember, all these items flow through from the partnership to the individual. So does the individual get to deduct charitable contributions directly online, you know, on the partnership line of ordinary income simply because it comes from a partnership? And the answer is no. Okay. If you think about a partnership... A partnership is basically several Schedule C's merged together into one entity. Okay. Theoretically, I could, if I, if, if I was designing the tax system, I could do this. I could say, instead of doing a partnership return and then getting a K-1 and doing all this other stuff, I want you to report all of your business operations on separate Schedule C's for everybody. First of all, that would be a lot of work. <laughs> I would, you know, and the bad news is that would require that the partnership would have to prepare the tax returns for the individuals as a result of that. Now, the partners, partners might not mind that because they would love it to get done by the same person who's doing all this stuff and not have to pay extra money for it. But what's going to end up happening is you're going to hire a person who knows what they're talking about about partnerships and maybe the partners, maybe other than this K1, the partner has nothing else of special significance. So they're going to go on TurboTax. Maybe they're going to go down to the local H and R Block. I got this K one, you know. We you know we have this partnership that we do. Blah blah blah. Throw it on there, and as long as it, as long as everything shows up in the in the K one and not necessarily in the notes, it's stupid easy. You don't really need to do a lot of thinking about it. Now, of course, as a CPA, I always love to get more work, particularly you know particularly easy work. I can charge a lot of money for. I'm always pretty happy with that. But um, but generally, those those kind of opportunities don't come by very often. OK, so I could do separate Schedule C's, but I don't. And the IRS doesn't want you to do it because they want it all in one form, too. And then they want to be able to see how this kind of breaks out. OK, so taking all that into consideration, when you're taking a look at why we do things under ordinary business losses and business income versus separately stated items, think about where it goes on the individual tax return. So if I have capital gains and losses, am I going to put that in ordinary business and in income items? No. I'm going to put that on Schedule D. If I have, um, you know, charitable contributions, no, that goes on Schedule A. What if I have investment interest that the partnership pays for that's not necessarily due to operations? Maybe I do some investment interest. You know, the partnership makes a lot of money, puts that money into the stock market, gets into some margin trading, does some interest. 
Does that go on the schedule in, in the operations? No, it goes on schedule A. So there's a lot of things that we do in the partnership and in the business. And this happens not only in the partnership, but also in S Corps, where it doesn't necessarily go into operations and needs to be separated out so that it can go to the proper place. Okay. And that's important because if we don't do that correctly, what ends up happening is uh, we don't we don't report things correctly and then and then people are taking advantage of things simply because of the way the entities form. And they don't, and the IRS doesn't always want to dis- encourage stuff like that. Now, sometimes they will allow you to do that. You know, I mean, if you do an S corp versus a partnership, you don't pay self employment tax on the business income. That's that's something that they do allow. But what they don't want to have happen is, oh, you're in a partnership. Oh, you can just take unlimited charitable contributions. No, that doesn't work that way. Okay, so that's that's kind of how this happens. Having done all that, let's talk about everything that we have to do here. Okay, so ordinary business losses. So that's if you think about it, anything that goes on a Schedule C, which is a business tax return, is generally going to go in ordinary business income and losses. Okay, now I'm not showing this in this video, and perhaps I probably should have, but you know, it's uh, you know due to a due to a a factor, uh, we've not done that. But when you're looking at this, go ahead and download Schedule K1 for 1065. And I'll, I'll kind of walk you through where some of this stuff goes. Now, it won't be all encompassing because we're not going to talk about everything that goes on Schedule K-1, but you might want to have a Schedule K-1 with you uh, when you're doing that. Okay. So all this stuff here, ordinary business lo- income and loss, is going to go on to box one. Separately stated items are going to go in everything from box two all the way down to box 20. Okay. That's how this ends up happening. Now, where does this come from and how does this work out? When we do the partnership tax return, you're going to have ordinary business and losses on page one. And then you're on, believe, I can't remember, I, I, it used to be, I think it's on page three now. Uh, they've been sh- shifting things around, but I think it's on page three. You'll see Schedule K. Schedule K has the aggregate of all the separately stated items that are going to be put together for the partnership as a whole. And then it gets broken out to per partner based on profit loss ratios. Okay. So if I have, um, you know, if I have a situation where I've got charitable, you know, say the corporation gave out uh, $30,000 and I've got three uh, partners, equal share, equal share partners, they're going to get a $10,000 deduction, you know, that's going to go on their K-1 that's going to go under the miscellaneous deduction. I believe it's box 13A, if I'm correct. Okay. So you're going to calculate and characterize a partnership's ordinary business loss income into separately stated items based on how they're reported to the how to report the items to the partner. So again, if I have charitable contributions, going to go in a different box. If I have capital gains, going to go in a different box. If I have 1231 gains, those have to go in a different box. What if I have some 1250 recapture? That has to be separately stated. Okay, so we have to break all that stuff out. Now, between you, me, and the fly in the wall and the NSA agent who's watching this, you're not going to actually be doing that. The computer's going to do a lot of that for you. But you've got to be smart enough in order to know whether the computer is doing it correctly or not. And so that's why we have to do this stuff. And that's usually why in the beginning in school we actually have you do a lot of stuff manually. But when you get to the, when you get to the firm, you're not going to be doing a lot of it manually. You're going to be doing it automatically. All right, so guaranteed payments. We've got fixed amounts that are going to be paid to the partner. So as we talked about when we talked about S corporations, corporations and all that sort of stuff. So corporations and S corporations are actually going to pay their owners as employees. So if you're constantly doing stuff within the firm and the organization and you're working for the firm and the organization, you have to pay yourself a salary for that, for the value of the services that you provide. As a partnership, you're going to do you're going to accomplish the same thing through what's called guaranteed payments. OK, so from an accounting standpoint, guaranteed payments are treated just like salary um, to the partners. Now, the difference on this is instead of in, from a tax perspective, there's a big difference. Instead of you filing out partnership uh, level, you know, um, uh, you know, payroll t- tax forms where you're going to have to do so quarterly withhold and remit and all that sort of stuff. The IRS basically says, fine, for partners, we're just going to do this. We're on box four. You're going to go ahead and you're going to fill out uh, the guaranteed payment section on that. Now, how does it get treated on the partner's return? So what will end up happening is they actually will pay self-employment tax and income tax on those guaranteed payments. So the way it gets treated at the partnership level is going to be that they're going to take it as though it is a salary 
and it's going to be a deduction from ordinary and necessary business income in box one. So if you think about it, the partnership makes a million dollars before guaranteed payments. Four partners, they pay each partner $100,000 a piece. They're going to subtract $400,000 from that box one income of a million dollars down to $600,000, and then each partner will have $100,000 pop to them. They'll have to pay self-employment tax on that, and they'll also have to pay income tax on that. So that's actually something that's very, very important uh, for you to take into consideration. Now, of course, if they're already paying on uh, their equal share of $150,000 on that $600,000 of income, they're probably already maxed out on the on the Social Security part, so they're going to only be paying mostly Medicare tax at that point. Okay, so it is treated uh, as ordinary income by receiving partners, and again, it is separately stated when sent to them. Self employment tax, uh, share of the business income uh, that you may see uh, treated by LLC members as self employment income, depending upon the extent of their involvement in the LLC. Okay. So what's going to happen is that you really have two different types of partners that you're going to have here. You're going to have general partners and limited partners. General partners are people who are constantly going to the work every single day, and they're working their butts off, and they're trying to make this happen. So maybe you've got three people who work together in a business. Um, you know, Say, for example, a flower shop. They have a flower shop. you got three partners. All three people go to the flower shop. Everybody does something different there. You know, They're trimming flowers. They're taking customer orders. They're doing all this sort of stuff. They're working together. All three of those are going to be considered general partners for tax purposes, okay? Not necessarily for legal purposes. For legal purposes, you can actually say, okay, we're going to, we're, we're going to do something a little different. But if that happens, that's a law side from a, from a general partnership side that's generally going to be the case. And there's going to be certain things that are going to require that, that you have that. So, for example, we have a situation where certain people are responsible for certain debts but not the other debts then that's going to be sort of a limiting factor, okay? Usually, people who are limited partners, they're just putting in money. They're not doing a whole lot. So say, for example, we do that flower shop. Maybe there's a fourth partner, so it's 25% for everybody involved. I'm partner number four. I have all the money. I don't want to do anything with the flower shop, but I'm going to give you guys $200,000 to go get started, okay? But I want 25% interest. What's going to end up happening is, um, I'm going to be treated as a limited partner. Therefore, none of my income that comes from that is going to be treated as self-employment income. It's all going to be considered as investment income. Now, it's not subject to the self-employment tax, but it will be subject to the net investment income tax. So you need to be able to take that into consideration. LLC members should be classified as general partners when applying the self-employment rules, and they have personal liability for the debts. Again, if they have the personal liability for the debts, authority to uh, contract on behalf of the LLC, or if they participate in more than 500 hours in the LLC's trade or business. Again, you, like I said, there, there's, these, are, these are sort of the tax rules. Um, there could be some legal rules that kind of get into this when you're talking about various states, and you want to make sure that you're talking about your states. Um, it's very rare. I've only heard of it once, where somebody was classified as a limited partner for legal reasons, but a general partner for... Um, uh, for, um, uh, you know, for, for tax reasons. And, it, and it, it, like I said, extremely rare. Uh, I almost never hear of it. And, and like I said, the one time that I heard of it, I was actually, uh, again, another, another friend of mine through CPA Connect that was kind of talking about that. You know, this, this was actually a question, can you do this? And we actually researched it and said, yeah, I guess legally you can. Um, generally speaking, though, if you're a general partner for, for tax, you're going to be a general partner for legal. And, and, I'm sorry. If you're a general partner for legal, you're going to be one for tax. If you're a limited partnership, a partner for legal, for you're going to be a limited partner for tax also. But tax has specific rules that you have to follow, and then each state's going to have their own rules to follow, and you got to make sure that you're keeping everything online. So the business imita uh, limitation on business interest expense, uh, a partner's uh, deduction for business interest uh, throughout the year. And we've talked about this in a previous um, slide, so I'm not going to hammer this too much. The limitation only, uh, this only, okay, so it says the limitation only applies to partnership with annual gross receipts of 26 million or more. Um, it, this is important because um, if, you, if, you, if you figure out that, the, that your partnership doesn't qualify for this as a box you check, you move on. 90%, actually, I would say, actually, 100% of my partnerships that I do here at the at, at Beta Solutions all qualify for the exception because they're way under $26 million. Um, but as you work at some of the bigger firms, so say you work at the big four, a national firm, or even a regional firm, you're more likely to run into the situation where these guys don't qualify for that. And so you're going to have to deal with that. Okay, so Qubid. 
Uh, Non-corporate general partners may deduct uh, 20% of qualified business income. So this is actually a big benefit for partnerships that, uh, you know, and, 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 and schedule C's that, uh, you know, that of course, corporations S corps get somewhat, but they also get kind of limited. Um, the one thing that's, that you have to understand QBI does not include guaranteed payments. That's the biggest portion of this. You know, if there's a QBI issue with this, they don't get it. And I, and I think that that's something that you need to, uh, to make sure that you're understanding. Cause what will end up happening is, you know, and, and I've had it where I've, I had a partnership where I was working with them on it and they, they, they thought they were getting the short end of the stick as a result of that. And I said, well, just decrease your amount of guaranteed payment. You don't have to pay yourself this. You guys can have the, you know, the, the, the secret handshake behind the scenes that says we're going to do the same thing, but we're just going to pay it out of distributions. You just have to be willing to uh, to make sure that you guys are equal to to the to the amount. And the biggest problem where you run into with guarantee payments, where guarantee payments really become a factor, is where you have one person who's working a lot more than the others. Uh, so, say for example, you got a four person partnership. You got one person who's doing it full time. You got three who's doing it part time. That full time person's going to want more in order to go there. And if you're insisting that all four have to be equal partners, the only one way to balance that out, guaranteed payments, okay, or special allocation. Actually, there you can do a special allocation. But generally speaking, you're not going to do that. Uh, you're going to just do guaranteed payments and move forward, okay, because it, it just works out better for everybody involved. But then you got to make sure that, that person gets themselves taken care of. You want to pay me $100,000? Fine. I want you to cover my taxes. That's what you need to do with your client. You know, if they say, oh, I want to do a guaranteed payment of, you know, 100,000 bucks, first thing out of your mouth should be make sure your taxes are taken care of because that's going to be a very important thing for your client. All right, partnership uh, items included in competition and net investment income tax. So this, so again, the net investment income tax, we didn't talk too much about that in this class um, just because, uh, you know, what it is. And net investment income tax is a tax that was enacted as a for, part of the Affordable Care Act back when, you uh, President Obama approved uh, or worked to get approved the health insurance uh, mandate, and this was part of that in order to help pay for it. Basically, what it is is an attack is a tax on net investment income over certain thresholds, and it includes interest, dividends, and royalties, annuities, rent. Um, you know, partner sh uh, share of income from a trader business that's passive. And then individual partner shares gains from dispositions of property not in an active trader business and separately stated items. Uh, you know, receiving them. This is a big thing. So so you want to make sure that you are um, keeping a, alive on this. And, and the big part that you need to do when you're doing a a, a, an individual's tax return who is a limited partner, make sure you check that box that says, yes, this is subject to the net. Uh, and if you say net, net investment income tax, but you want to make sure it's subject to the net if that's the case and you want to know that. So exhibits uh, 620, uh, I'm sorry, 20-6, <laughs> golly, these videos are getting long for me. <laughs> But um, here's what's here's what's happening. So common separated items, uh, investment, uh, interest in uh, interest income. Uh, you have guaranteed payments. Uh, all, all this stuff is pretty. And I think some of this is pretty self-explanatory. The one that I get a lot of questions on from students is why is 179 part of that number? And why is that a separately stated item? And that's because there's certain income thresholds that you have to hit. So, for example, your partnership may not hit those thresholds, but if the partner is involved in other activities that does have the income in order to be able to do it, you can do the 179. And so that's why it's very important. Uh, another factor of it is, um, uh, you know, like I said, I, I, as I recall, I think this rule still allow you to add in um, portions of the salary that they get thrown into this and then health insurance and all that sort of stuff when trying to figure out for uh, the 179 deduction. And the good news is 99% of it, your, your system's going to do all that work for you. But, you know, again, you want to make sure that you're, you're checking this and making sure that everything is on the up and up on it. All right. Partnership compliance issues. Although they don't pay taxes, you do have to file the 1065 and it is due by March 15th. Now, most tax returns when you don't file on time, the penalty is based on how much you owe. Okay, that's all it is. With partnership returns, that's not the case because they don't owe any money. So if you file late, what's going to end up happening is you're going to get penalized $100 a month per month per K-1 that you didn't issue out. So if you have a partnership that's got four partners and you file it 12 months late, you're going to get 48 times $100 for a penalty. Uh, it adds up quite a bit. 
Okay, so you want to make sure that you are uh, keeping up with that. So, you, you know, which it doesn't sound like much to begin with, but when you got to go to a partner and say, hey, we were 12 months late, you know, we're doing the partnership. Now, if, if it's the firm's fault, it's going to be a big deal for you. But if this is the partners who are just kind of gaffing you off, this is a way to get them into your your office saying, hey, you guys are going to get hit $100 per K-1 per month if you guys don't do this. $4,800 is a lot of money. So you want to make sure that, you, that they're keeping up on that. Uh, page one of 1065 will show the details, and I've already talked about that. Page three, that is page three. Uh, K1 is listing partnership, ordinary business income, and separately stated items. And then the K1s are included with the 1065 when they're filed out, but they're also sent, a copy of it is sent to the client for them to use. Okay, because they have to attach a copy of that to their return. Now, normally, if they do e-file, they're not going to attach anything. They're just going to put in the details, and then it's going to get set into the matching system to make sure everything lines up. But if you do a paper file, you do have to attach a copy of that K-1. All right, so that's all i got to say about this video. I want to say thank you very much for watching. I'm looking forward to seeing you at the next video.